This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. Well... We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and joining me today we have a very special guest live in London. It's our associate producer, Amy Nelson. Hi, Amy. Well, hello. I'm so excited, first of all, to be over here in London and just super excited and honoured to be on your show I've listened since day one and absolutely love it. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Amy. You've been one of our greatest supporters ever since the beginning. And it's wonderful to have you here in the UK. Um, normally, primitive culture, we seem to be sort of touring around the place, but it's nice when people come to us as well. So uh, that makes a change, I guess. Um, the reason we have Amy on the show today is this is actually an episode we've been talking about doing for quite some time. And the topic that we're looking at today is something that Amy is something of an expert in. It's teaching, teaching in Star Trek. Obviously, Obviously, lots of people talk about Star Trek as a kind of set of parables or kind of lessons for for life or for kind of moral instruction in themselves. But really what we're going to focus on a little bit more today, I think, is the role of teaching within the Star Trek universe, the kind of glimpses that we see of it, of the teachers that we encounter, often quite briefly, and of the kind of impact that they're having on the lives of the children, generally children, that they come into contact with. But I thought before we started looking at kind of teaching within the Star Trek universe, Amy, maybe you could talk a little bit about your own teaching experience and how Star Trek has kind of fed into that for you and how you use Star Trek in your teaching. Well, I do use Star Trek in my teaching as much as possible. I try and uh, incorporate it, whether in passing, just saying, well, in Star Trek and sort of use that world, Mm -hmm. you know, as an example of where we can go and and what uh, technologies and You know, that I'm trying to push these kids to think outside of the box. Specific examples are like when I teach logic, I use the scene from Harry's Mud's Women. Mm -hmm. Right. At at the end, and uh, Kirk gives the paradox. Oh, what is it? I am. Oh, oh I am not that. lying I'm a bit to you. Allergic to Harry Mudd episodes, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a few years, but I know the kind of thing yeah. He you says, mean, one of those, yeah. "I am not lying to you." Right, and so then that paradox because computers are either yes, no, mm-hmm. on, off, you know, uh, binary. So uh, we talk about then what is a statement, and then that launches my whole lesson mm-hmm. into into statements and mathematical statements. Um, I also use I my minors in communications. Mm-hmm. And when I put together a lesson, I used uh, Loud as a Whisper, where uh, Reva has his chorus. Oh, yeah. And and how we would communicate differently if we had one person speaking one intent and how that would change and how we don't have that. So our intentions may be muddled or unclear Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of talked about that. So uh, I've used it a lot in math and in communications. And I think you mentioned I was listening to your episode of the Trek Profiles podcast, uh, which is a great conversation if anyone wants to go and check that episode out. It's really interesting. And you talked about using the holodeck to represent a now, I'd never heard of this expression, a Cartesian coordinate uh, grid. Is that yes. right? Yes. There you go. So I learned something, but I don't know what I've learned. You have oh, to explain my goodness. It to me. <laughs> okay. So Rene Descartes, uh-huh. who you should know. I have know. heard of him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, think I think therefore, therefore I, am. I am. That's yes. as far as it goes for me. <laughs> well, he was a philosopher and a mathematician, mm-hmm. and he was the one that started the named after him Cartesian coordinate grid, which mm-hmm. is our X, Y okay. axis. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the story goes is that he saw a fly landing on a wall. 
And this grid system came up in his mind as mm-hmm. to if I wanted to locate where that fly is on the wall, then how would I do that? And that's where we got ah, it. Fascinating. So that whole grid system that he imagined in my mind is the holodeck, you know, because that right, is course. completely yeah. grids. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I um, teach my kids that as well. So it's a kind of good visual reference in yes. a sense for, uh, and I suppose, you know, I mean, I don't know how much we know about how the holodeck actually works, but there is that kind of, I guess that's partly why they have those grids, isn't it? Is to emphasize how two-dimensional and empty that space is. Do you know yes. what I mean? Beautiful. Um, and then obviously these then imaginative, it fills up, wonderful yeah. three-dimensional things uh-huh. fill it up. Yeah. I'm curious when you talk about using these examples in the classroom. I mean, when I was at school, uh, I was in Star Trek. Most people probably weren't of my age. There was one teacher that I know of who I first saw the pilot episode of Caretaker in my biology classroom because the biology teacher was very keen on Star Trek and he would screen stuff after school. But he certainly never would have mentioned it in the classroom, I don't think. And I think there was definitely a sense there were kind of a handful of Star Trek fans, but we were definitely a kind of minority. Uh, We weren't the cool kids. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just curious, like, if a teacher had brought up Star Trek in the classroom then... I think they'd have hit a bit of a wall of kind of sort of mainstream hostility. But I don't know whether that's something that's changed as kind of, you know, nerd and geek culture and so on has become more mainstream and whether that's something that, you know, these days, maybe in your experience, or maybe it's different in the States as well, that you get a kind of warmer reception to that. Because I gather from your Trek Profiles piece that, you know, your students have really embraced it and kind of they're bringing you cards and they're bringing you presents and they're bringing you, oh, you know, that's all Star for Trek extra credit. Stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's the kind of equivalent of the teacher's apple. You're getting like, yes. Star Trek merchandise instead. Uh, yes, that is, that is true. Well, I think the difference is I don't remember knowing anything personal about my teachers. Mm-hmm. I mean, back in the day. Mm-hmm. And... And so there's been a, a shift in how teachers relate to their kids. And part of that is, you know, building a different kind of relationship, appropriate, of course. Mm-hmm. So that's why, like, I bring this part of my life to them to try and get a connection. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, now it's like, oh, my dad watches that, you right. know? Okay. So yeah. there is that common bond there where they at least are aware of Star Trek. Whereas, yeah, I don't think if, if my teachers back in the day, I could probably name two good friends mm. that I have now that were into Star Trek, but I didn't know anyone else. Mm. Mm. I think that's really important to kind of see your teachers as human beings in some ways. And I think a lot of teachers, I mean, I'm thinking back again to my own school experience. They're very keen to protect themselves, I think, by putting up a kind of wall of, you know, partly professionalism, partly it's kind of, you know, whether it's a reputation for like I had a teacher who everyone was terrified of him. They thought he was really strict. Actually, he was quite a sort of reasonable person, if you know what I mean. But it was very obviously an act. It was like a caricature almost. And I think there was a lot of that. And I remember towards the end of my sort of schooling, there were a few teachers who were a bit more open about, you know, sort of talking about their own lives and and that kind of thing. Um, And that was quite unusual at the time. But they did, you know, students really responded to that. And they responded to feeling like, you know, these were human beings that they were interacting with, not just this kind of, you know, sort of official machine almost that they were being processed through. So I think that's that's really important. Maybe we should move on now uh, to talk a little bit about the kind of teaching that we see within the Star Trek universe. And I know um, Next Generation is your kind of, um, that's your, your comfort zone in yes, a sense. So, yes. so why don't we start uh, by talking a little bit about the school on the Enterprise D. I mean, we see, I think, various teachers in that school briefly. We don't really get to know any of them particularly, but we sort of get a bit of a sense of what that school environment is like. And obviously, I guess this was a big departure for Star Trek because up till that point, uh, you know, in Kirk's time, this was a military vessel. It was kind of going out there. There wouldn't be kids on board, right. um, except in, you know, exceptional circumstances. The Enterprise D very consciously was a ship with families on board. And if you've got families, then of course you've got children and they're going to have the needs that children have, including being educated. When I was I was looking through, I, w- I went on Memory Alpha to sort of look at which episode should I go back and look at that have the school in. And it's interesting because it comes up briefly quite early on. I think it's in When the Bow Breaks in mm-hmm. season one. And then there was a whole chunk of episodes in about season five. I sort of wondered whether had they built that set and then decided they should get the most out of it because they were like <laughs> so two or three in a row, basically, where the school crops up suddenly. But I think it's kind of interesting. And it also it sort of ties into that, you know, they're having concerts in 10 Forward. They're doing art classes. There's this whole kind of rich cultural life of the Enterprise D, I suppose. And and the school kind of 
plays into that. But how do you as a teacher, how do you, what's your sort of impression of the educational establishment on board that ship? (laughs) How would you grade it? Well, um, I think it's very superficial, Mm -hmm. um, as I think most uh, TV shows portray education. We Mm -hmm. can talk about that. But, you know, when you first came at me with this uh, topic, I was like, yeah, it seems like when I just initial response was, well, all they're doing is art class and molding clay. Mm. Like that was my first response. And I'm like, that is nowhere near what a school is. Now, granted, I teach secondary school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, more advanced 15 to 18 year old students. And we generally see outside of the case of Amanda, the Q, Amanda, Mm. like they are elementary age school kids. So Mm. I am not that familiar with the curriculum, albeit I know that it's not a full day of artistic and modeling clay Mm -hmm. and, you know, building blocks or whatever so playing with puppies yes you know, yeah. playing with puppies <laughs> great though that would be you know that's that's not going to fill the school day that's true. yeah and so and and i get like tv isn't going to show the mundane of and mundane as people would think of math classes although it is not <laughs> um you know so they're going to try and highlight the more exciting parts of school i guess and so that's why they would do that and i guess also to um show the creativity mm-hmm. that you need arts in the future. And maybe that's, you know, intentional as well because mm. arts and electives are definitely under the gun, at least in America and are being phased out because of uh, budgetary constraints. One of the things I was struck by is that in, when the bow breaks, there's this discussion about, there's this quite young boy. I mean, primary school age boy who's complaining about having to learn calculus at school. Now, uh, maths was never my strongest subject, so you, <laughs> you can educate me a bit on this, but I don't think I ever learned calculus at school. And I did GCSE maths and I got an A star, I think. So, you know, I was obviously reasonably good at maths at that point. But first of all, that surprised me. And, and then the, the sort of emphasis on that episode was very much on they were take the kids were taken down to this planet and here they were going to be educated in a different way. They weren't going to have to study maths, basically. They weren't going to have to learn science or history or sort of the serious subjects. It was all kind of arts and crafts and so on. It was almost, it sort of felt like a sort of Montessori school or something, this mm. kind of, you know, child focused. And it was all very much about tapping into the potential of each child, but not having a curriculum where everyone has to learn to any extent the same thing. And then it surprised me going forward and watching those other episodes that, as you say, that is basically all we see on the Enterprise D generally is it is exactly that kind of, uh, you know, expression through pottery or, or whatever yeah. it is, you know, <laughs> where, why don't we see the calculus class? Maybe, maybe they think that's not dramatic. I don't know. Although maybe I would have learned something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I don't think that, I mean, young kids would be learning calculus, mm. but they have started teaching algebra, algebraic concepts Mm -hmm. in the younger years, Uh, just getting those ideas, you know, instead of saying, well, five plus a question mark equals eight, Mm -hmm. you know, so that's the idea of algebra, and then replace the question mark with an X, and there you have a Mm -hmm. one-step equation. So Mm -hmm. um, I think those concepts are being introduced actually earlier now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Common Core has done that and some curriculums are doing that. But yeah, as far as calculus, that I have not seen that. <laughs> I kind of assumed that was like, uh, you know, this is early TNG. This is kind of Roddenberry at his most sort of utopian in the future. You know, not only do children not get upset when their parents die, but they, you know, they... Um, can study these advanced concepts at a younger age. And who knows, by the time they get to 16, who knows what they're learning about, you know, warp field theory or something. (laughs) Well, yeah. And we have, you know, famous mathematicians like Carl Friedrich Gauss, who, you know, was graduating and being a professor at the age 15. I mean, those are your extreme examples. I would not say the Mm. norm, Mm. even Mm. in the 24th century. Mm. I guess one of the sort of things that cropped up um, looking at some of these episodes in Star Trek is, you know, we do see teachers in the classroom Although they feel more like they're sort of looking after the emotional needs of the kids more than they are 
there's an emphasis on discipline. Sometimes there's an emphasis on kind of safety and that kind of thing and, and kind of keeping an eye on them rather than necessarily teaching them anything. Uh, but we oh, also you see... mean a glorified babysitter. <laughs> yeah, yes. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yes. That's, that, that's what it feels like. The school on the Enterprise D, I think, feels a bit like a crash sometimes. It's mm-hmm. like somewhere to park the kids, to keep them out of harm's way, you know, more than it is somewhere that actually feels like a kind of structured learning environment. But we also see in Next Gen, in episode Rascals, uh, educational software, because we see that fish that sort of that asks questions and answers questions. And the Picard, once he's been shrunk to, you know, um, de-aged to child proportions, finds it quite frustrating because it's quite limited compared to the kind of regular computer. But it does raise a kind of interesting question about the role of educational software. You know, I know in schools these days, uh, I expect this is even more the case in America, but I hear about, you know, kids having iPads and, and things rather than carrying around huge textbooks and so on. So, you know, even in my lifetime, things have changed. Uh, a lot in terms of the use of technology. We see it again in Deep Space Nine in the episode Children of Time. There's that quite funny scene where there's this kind of maths teacher Quark, basically. And Quark (laughs) is kind of doing the sums and sort of almost like sort of Sesame Street or something is kind of presenting these problems and kids are solving them and so on. This real world problem. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Story problem. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Those kind of story problems. And and in one of those Deep Space Nine episodes, I think the first one where, where they set up the school on Deep Space Nine, what Jake Sisko is saying is basically I'm getting bored just doing all my learning from a computer. So I guess there's that kind of assumption that you can effectively educate a child purely through software. Do you know what I mean? Through, through, you know, giving them stuff to read or watch or so on. And that therefore on these starships and so on, particularly if there aren't that many kids, maybe that's what they do. They just literally sit in front of a screen all day. But I mean, that seems to me you're missing a lot of the kind of learning experience of school isn't literally just following the textbooks. You know, there's a lot more in terms of the kind of social elements, dealing with other people, you know, dealing with kind of, hierarchical structures and you know what I mean all, all that sort of stuff that you learn from going to school isn't literally just what's on the page in front of you yeah you can definitely see a transition uh, now that we have technology and studying it and deciding how much to use in my classroom definitely has been a struggle so in seeing and using technology there's definitely been a phase. I mean, they have started these online schools, K-12 online is mm-hmm. one example. And, but they still have a teacher. I think they tried to do straight online, just like you're saying, here's the curriculum, you learn it, take mm-hmm. a test and then pass. But there is that social element. We have some where they have your activity days. And so you get to choose to you know, if you're going to go to this park, if you're going to go to this museum, mm-hmm. like that's inside the, the this online curriculum as well as learning your stuff mm-hmm. online. Mm-hmm. I can't speak to that success. I have friends who teach for online schools. They get to do it from their home mm-hmm. um, and they enjoy it. I don't know how their interaction is with the students. They say they have students, so I have to believe them. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it seems weird because presumably, I mean, when you train to be a teacher, I mean, I imagine a lot of the training is about the kind of interactions and the, do you know what I mean? Like how to deal with a class. Oh, and yeah. Of, it's not just the, it's not just the imparting of information. It's the whole yeah, the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's the social, it's, you know, how are you going to handle this disagreement? How are you going to, you know, handle peer pressure? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, how are you going to juggle all of the expectations? And you get that in a school environment. So within my classroom, I have, you know, in part because we need that differentiation and we have this technology and limited time, um, some of our listeners may, may be familiar with uh, the flipped classroom where I record a video that they watch before coming to class. And okay. then, so then they have the pre knowledge, and mm-hmm. then I get to go in straight to the examples and answer their questions. So the time isn't in, I get the time in class to, really help the kids with their problems and less time instructing because the instructing Mm -hmm. like, you know, blah, here's your information now working it through. That's where they need the guidance more Mm -hmm. than me telling them a squared plus B squared equals C squared, you know? Mm -hmm. So that flipped classroom, I've done that for um, a couple of years and it's been pretty um, successful. 
However, going back to that example in Deep Space Nine with it just being Quark, I think that is something important because uh, the research shows that when you do a flipped classroom, like it needs to be your voice. Mm. So if I just pulled some random video off the internet or had someone else record it for me, um, it wouldn't be as impactful right. with my students because my students know me. And yeah. so when they hear my voice instructing them, it's more impactful mm. and they remember it more. So that online, I just don't see Yeah. it. It, well, the research is showing that it's not that effective as if it were compared to their normal teacher. Right, right. And I guess the other side of that is, I mean, people have always homeschooled kids. But I guess, again, you get the same kind of issue that, you know, I mean, partly with homeschooling, you get people who aren't teachers teaching. But also then you miss out on the whole institutional side of, of schooling, which I, I mean, understand, I know a lot of people, a lot of people hate going to school, you know, a lot of people don't look back fondly on that. And yeah. so maybe they think that's something that they've escaped. But it seems to me like you're kind of missing something by doing it that way. I was thinking a little bit of in Voyager, you, you know, we have Naomi Wildman, who I don't think we ever really see much of her education. But I sort of always got the impression she's effectively being homeschooled like by Neelix and by, by you know, not just members of the crew, because obviously that's the only people who are there, but also by kind of close family members or sort of surrogate family members. And I guess we see it in Next Gen as well uh, with the child where there's that discussion about Wesley and if he's going to stay on board. And Picard, I think, says, oh, well, Data's going to teach you the kind of sciencey stuff effectively uh and but then everyone has a role to play so you know um Riker is supposed to be kind of it's also slightly unclear to me what they're doing but I think Riker is sort of saying he'll be responsible for his kind of personal development and, right you, you know yeah. keeping him out of trouble and, and Worf kind of will tuck him in Worf will at tuck night, him in at night yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that kind of very much the idea of like they're collectively taking responsibility which I suppose in some ways you, you know you might have to some extent in a school environment if there's a child that has particular needs that people might be able to sort of step forward and do that but again it's very much kind of getting away from the kind of institutional setup yeah well and i just talking about that just you know so many teachers you know if especially in secondary like where you have six to eight different teachers plus a counselor like mm -hmm. you can really develop and learn how to interact with adults much more outside of your home, mm -hmm. you know, because that's your mom and dad. Like you talk to them differently than you do other adults. So I think it really helps uh, the development of a child when they're at school. Mm. And you studied counselling, right? In, yes. in an educational environment. Yeah. Which explains why Troy is your favourite character. I yes, think, you know, she is. that's very much uh, <laughs> her sort of remit. I mean, I don't think... When I was at school, we, we certainly didn't have a school counsellor, I don't think. But I guess there's... You know, there are... Maybe there are always members of staff who kind of fulfil that role. Is that... I mean, yes. is that how it works in your school? That there's, there's not a dedicated counsellor, but there are... Yeah, People well, we have well. four counselors. Right. Um, most schools do. Um, and then they have those kids, depending on how it's set up, but for the four years that mm -hmm. they're at school. Yeah, I mean, I just as a teacher, mm. when I first started teaching, these kids would start coming to me and telling me their problems. And I'm like, mm. I'm a math teacher. I am not equipped to handle these situation that these kids, and especially at, at risk kids mm. you know what they have to go through and and I was like I need more education and so that was why I went into counseling because I mm. needed to have skills and ways to help these kids and to help them process and ask the right questions so that they could you know find a good solution in their life mm. so. and to know that there are people that they can talk to I guess yeah. as well you know that's that's very important obviously um, and obviously on the Enterprise, everyone has Counselor Troy they can go to if they yes. need to. I mean, it, it struck me watching some of these episodes this week that because I was looking at episodes that feature the school, I was also looking a lot at the episodes that feature children. And in some ways, I feel like we see Troy counselling children more than counselling adults, weirdly. Do you know what I mean? Even though her job is essentially to look after the mental health of the whole crew, it's actually fairly rarely that we ever see her counselling one of the other bridge crew, you know. I mean, it, it, well, it does happen now Well, outside of yeah, I'll, I but think then it's, it's often more, more of advice than, do you know what I mean? Like right. a proper counselling session. Okay. Whereas with these kids, particularly, I think you're like, is it Hero Worship? Hero the Worship, boy who uh -huh. decides to be an android or whatever. Yeah. You know, she's really kind of getting into these psychological issues and, and trying to help them. Yeah. 
Definitely. I love her in that episode, by the mm. way. That's mm. that's very good. And d- she does, we see her counseling a lot more with when Alexander comes on. You sure. know, and with yes. Worf and, yeah. and getting that relationship working and functioning. And she's got her work cut out for her there, for sure. <laughs> with the two of them. That maybe brings us on to the other thing that I was thinking in terms of next gen that we see in terms of the school teachers mm-hmm. is that there's that sense that, yeah, as you said, they're, they're, they're kind of keeping an eye on the kids while they play with clay or whatever there's also i suppose particularly in new ground when alexander comes on board there's this idea of discipline and like how do you how do they discipline them and there's that kind of tension in that episode you can kind of feel it that um you know when the teacher is saying oh alexander's stolen this toy and wolf is there who a is the head of security on the ship you know massively outranks her as a civilian b is quite an imposing character in himself C is obsessed with honour and all this kind of yes. stuff and is going to really freak out in his own way if it turns out his son is a thief and this poor teacher is like having to confront him with this information. But I thought that was kind of quite interesting, the sort of challenge, because compared to a lot of the other teachers that we see in Next Gen, she's one that we, I guess, because she gets a few scenes and also we we sympathise with her because she is in this quite difficult situation. You, you know, you get to see things from her perspective slightly, as well as Troy's perspective, as well as Worf's perspective and so on. You get a bit of a sense that the teacher is is definitely doing her best there. Yeah, I think New Ground is the best we see of an actual teacher. Like, mm-hmm. I would identify her as the most teacher-esque out mm-hmm. of anyone that we've seen on Star Trek. Um, I, I talked about this uh, on a Earl Grey when we did our season five, uh, just because she is so amazing. And she confronts Worf, yes, who is this monumous figure, and is doing it because she wants to help Alexander mm. and to teach him. And it's difficult to tell a parent, much less a Klingon parent, mm. um, your child is not performing, your child is not behaving. Like these are serious concerns that any parent would want to have fixed. And, you know, and the parent, you know, kids act differently. Mm. And the parents, uh, even some that I've come across, well, not my child. Well, yeah, your mm. child is doing this. And to not be supported um, either from the parents or from the administration is very, very difficult. Mm. And we see Worf not support what the teacher is saying. And that infuriates me so much. And then when confronted and finds the figurine in Alexander's like, there's the proof, like, mm. you know, trust your teachers. And I know not all teachers are the best. Mm. I, I totally get that. But you know, to raise a child who's going to be acting differently in different situations, like it, it takes a village and mm. the teachers are part of your village. And so you want to, you know, support your teachers. And she does such a good job of not accusing Worf. Mm. Um, where have you been his whole life? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so much to blame Worf and she doesn't do any of that. She just wants to correct the problem so that it doesn't happen again, so that Alexander can learn how to, you know, be in a classroom and, and be amongst peers. Mm. And there's that great moment as well where she says, oh, Alexander told me Klingons don't listen to teachers. And Wolf sort of almost explodes and says, I didn't say that. Uh, and, and she says, oh, no, I'm not saying, you know, of course, yeah. you, obviously you didn't say that. I, yeah. But he thinks that she thinks that he did say it. Right. You know? So there's that kind of I suppose there's also that kind of tension. There's a kind of cultural, is there a scope for kind of cultural misunderstanding or cultural kind of clash of, you know, I don't, I don't think we've ever seen a Klingon school, but I imagine it's quite different to mm-hmm. <laughs> the school on the Enterprise D. And, you, you know, what are the kind of expectations there? Um, and Alexander is definitely a bit of a problem child in a sense in that episode. It, it was interesting for me going back and watching Rascals. I'd sort of forgotten this, but obviously in Rascals, you have all the adults who look like children who are doing these, you, you know, who have to save the day. But actually Alexander plays quite a big role in that episode. And I was thinking, because when we meet him, uh, I don't know if you've, have you seen the Deep Space Nine episodes where he comes back? As I, a, I know of you it. You know of it, yes. right. Okay. He's a bit sort of hopeless in, in those yes. episodes and, and, and not very competent really. But in Rascals... He does a pretty good job. You he know. does, yeah. <laughs> they make him part of the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't really feel any less part of it in a way than the characters who are actually adults, even yeah. if they don't look like it. So it's kind of, um, I thought that was interesting that, you know, being in that school environment, we sort of see that he obviously has grown and kind of Yeah, we definitely improved. agree. Yeah, I agree with you because he, he does uh, fit in better and, you know, sort of gets those little tantrums worked out. Mm. 
just in terms of discipline, the other episode that kind of came to mind, because I think when I, when we were first talking about doing this episode about teaching, you said, oh, are we going to look at Starfleet Academy? Mm -hmm. And my instinct is that, is to, maybe that's something we might look at in a different episode, because it's, I suppose, because I sort of see Starfleet Academy as a sort of military training, you, you know, it's like joining the army or something. And I think that's a bit different. On the other hand, I think if you think of something like the first duty, there's very much a sense there, you know, the, they're quite young people. And the issues there, they're kind of, okay, it might not be something that happens in a school. Well, you know, kids do get killed in horrific incidents at school. And so, I mean, it's, it's quite dramatic for something to happen in school. But at yeah. the same time, that idea that something has happened, kids are covering it up, people are covering for each other. Do you know what I mean? No one can quite get to the truth. And that kind of sense, when we were talking about this episode beforehand, I was saying it reminded me of the TV show 13 Reasons Why, mm -hmm. uh, which I know is not a favourite show of yours for various reasons. But one of the things I found so sad about that show was the sense that the adults and the kids are just in different worlds. Do you know what I mean? And there's there's not much ability to bridge that gap. And I guess that's one of the things that is probably the hardest to do as a teacher is to to have that sense that if something's going on in one of these young people's lives that they will come to you or that they will... Do you know what I mean? That you'll be able to prevent something like that from happening. And definitely in the first duty, there's that sense that it's a challenge for the adults to kind of reconstruct what's going on in these young people's lives when they're deliberately shutting them out. And someone yes. like Beverly just doesn't get it, even when all the evidence is saying her son is lying. She's, you know, she's saying, well, of course you're telling the truth. You yeah. know, there must be, yeah. the, the information must be wrong. This must be wrong. You know, she's just not able to kind of imagine herself into that situation at all. Yeah, she's one of those parents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there definitely is that disconnect, especially when kids, you know, get into trouble together or, mm -hmm. you know, are scheming together for good or for ill. There is such a huge disconnect. And sometimes like even now the kids will come back later and tell me, well, this happened, you know, last month or whatever. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why didn't you share with me so I could help you go through this together, you know? And they're either embarrassed or, you know, whatever the the situation. But there is, I think the older you get, the less you're going to involve adults into your life. Mm -hmm. And and we definitely, I think, yeah, in Starfleet Academy, who you remember out of that is Boothby, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, well, what about your, you know, teachers and professors and stuff like that? But Boothby is the one that people remember. Well, Picard and... Yeah, and Wesley. maybe it's because Boothby has no official status in a sense. He can... It's, you get the sense Boothby's the only one who knows what they're up to. Do you yeah, know what I mean? He's the exactly. only one who knows what the dynamics are. He understands it because... Maybe because people aren't putting on a front for Boothby, if you mm -hmm. know what I mean. They're kind of... Maybe they're more themselves or whatever. Uh, and so he sort of has that access. But also that idea that I suppose, I don't know if we ever find out what it was that Picard did or, or didn't do or, you know, what that influence was. But obviously he had some kind of crisis in his own life and that Boothby was the one who was able to kind of nudge him in the right direction, but without kind of, without reporting him to the authorities or yeah. doing whatever the, do you know what I mean? All, all that side of thing, which I guess is what Picard tries to do for Wesley by saying, look, you know, if you, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's sort of a no-win scenario for Wesley. Right. <laughs> He's basically saying, you know, either you do this or I'm going to do it for you. Right. But yeah. at the same time, there is that sense that he's he's at least giving him the opportunity to resolve the situation himself in a way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it must be very difficult being aware of peer pressure and kind of the relationship between students and, you know, the influence that one student might be having on another and so on and trying to handle that in a kind of sensitive way. Sensitive, to, you know, yeah. I wouldn't explain. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you just reminded me of a scenario. We had semester exams at mm -hmm. the end of May and uh, one kid, thankfully, mm. student A was like, Miss Nelson, uh, I saw so-and-so student B with his mm. phone out. Mm. I was like, okay, don't have phones out on exam days. So... I approached student B and I said, uh, what are you doing? Give me your phone. And I had to track him down. This mm. was like he was on his way to the next his next class. So I take his phone. Well, I don't take it. He I said, show me your photos. Mm. And there were pictures of my test. Mm. And I said, uh, what are you doing with these? And he's like, I can't tell you. I said, no, you will tell me. <laughs> I yeah. said, you are going to get yourself into more trouble. So yeah. you need to tell me right now. And I can be 
a little intimidating when I need to be. Mm -hmm. And so he showed me and he said, well, student C asked him for these pictures Mm because he had it, you know, earlier on in the day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, did you send them? Show me the text message. Mm -hmm. He hadn't sent them yet. And Mm -hmm. he's like, I wasn't going to send them. Whatever. (laughs) I don't believe you. Whatever. Yeah. And so, I mean, I had to, you know, bear down on these kids to get the truth out. Mm. And yeah, why? And I, the kid C is this popular jock type of kid Mm -hmm. pressuring, you know, this, I would say, unpopular kid in the school to do his bidding. And that infuriated me. And like, yeah, that these kids have to deal with peer pressure, but they have to learn how to, to stand up for themselves. And hopefully in our discussion that we, uh, he will learn. Yeah. Yeah. In the future. Yeah. I guess that's a kind of perennial thing, isn't it? And I mean, it's interesting. The first duty, the, the Nick Lacano character is very much that kind of, seems like the kind of jock or the kind right. of, do you know what I mean? There's something yeah. about. He's uh, the popular. Exactly. Kid. He's the popular kind of handsome tall guy who's, mm-hmm. you know, everyone wants to be like, and he definitely has that kind of influence to exert, which must be difficult to kind of yeah. to work with those kind of things. But I guess one of the things that strikes me about that is, you know, this is one of the reasons that presumably we want teachers to be trained and to be experienced and so on. And one of the things I'd say that we see in Star Trek is that that is maybe not very helpful is this kind of idea that anyone can become a teacher given the right circumstances. I mean, in Voyager, there's quite a funny episode or it's a sort of B-plot in the episode of Ashes to Ashes where Seven of Nine becomes a teacher uh, and is hopeless at it because she doesn't, she's too strict and she's always punishing everyone. And, mm-hmm. and you know, and she's scheduled and she, and Chicote says to her at one point, um, you know, there's no fun in these kids day. And she says, no, there is look. And she brings up the schedule and it has, you know, 10, 15 to 10, 25 fun. In capital <laughs> you know? But it's like, she doesn't get any of the kind of need for spontaneity or, you, you know, anything mm-hmm. like that. But then also, of course, in Deep Space Nine, the main teacher that we get in Deep Space Nine is Keiko O'Brien, who mm-hmm. I think is an interesting, example of a teacher in some ways i mean she's a very unpopular character generally and in some ways i feel she gets a bit of a hard time keiko o'brien on the other hand i don't, I don't know whether it helps i, I think it's it, it's interesting that they chose to put her in this teaching position because it gives her something to do when they've kind of basically said she's a botanist they don't need a botanist so there's no reason for her to be there other than as miles's wife on the other hand it's very clear, you know, she says herself, well, I'm not a teacher. I don't know anything about teaching. She says, oh, I sort of always thought maybe I could be a teacher. Uh, and then she does really throw herself into it. So, you know, by the end of that first season, it's become, it's definitely become important to her. And she obviously is putting a lot of effort into her teaching. But at the same time, there is this sort of weird question, like, if they've got a space station with all these kids on board, don't they need an actual teacher? I mean, can't they get them from somewhere? They must have, like, Federation, you know however you hire you know just like if they need an engineer or they need a you know i don't know someone to run one of the shops or or whatever it is could they not get a real teacher i suppose yeah this is a huge can of worms that Mm. you are now opening up (laughs) so let's dig in (laughs) okay first of all i think having keiko come in yeah she's a botanist why is she it just adds to the disillusionment that well, if you can't do, then mm-hmm. you teach. Yeah. And I cannot stand that. There's... Okay. So I don't like the fact that they're reinforcing, oh, anyone can be a teacher. And mm. why does everyone think that? Because everyone's been through education. Mm-hmm. So they have, because they've been through it, they think that they can do it. And that is not the case. There is a lot of training, a lot of expertise that goes into teaching, Um, at least if you want to be good. Thankfully, Keiko, I do believe, is a good teacher. She is, you know, getting down to the curriculum. You see later, you know, in just the little snippets. Oh, what was the one I just watched? Oh, In the Hands of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's like, this is the curriculum, and she knows what she should be teaching, and and I give her credit for that. There is, uh, at least in the United States, it's called ARL, um, where you're bringing in professionals Mm -hmm. into the teaching program. Mm -hmm. And so they have uh, a shorter, uh, quicker way to get licensed to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's faster. It's easier than what I had to go through as a teacher. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, that really values <laughs> me and my time, but that's for another topic. <laughs> um, so we are, you know, I'm now seeing a lot of these ARL teachers coming in from the professional world. Some are successful, some are not. And I mm-hmm. would only say 50%. Really? I mean, yeah. it, it's so difficult coming in from a professional world and then trying to teach it. Mm. Like, I think um, just because you know your subject doesn't mean that you can teach it. Sure. And just because you know your subject doesn't mean that you can teach it to children. Yeah. Even more difficult. So I don't like the fact that Keiko is going around saying, oh, twiddle dee, twiddle dum, what should I do? Oh, I'm going to start a school. Like, that's, I, I didn't appreciate that, but I do appreciate that she did become that teacher um, and then know the curriculum. And it seems like she's able to do with that. Mm. Another thing I didn't like, mm. when Keiko was uh, visiting Earth, who was the substitute teacher? <laughs> <I know. laughs> Miles. Yeah. So he's now a substitute teacher and yeah. running the station. Like, when does that he was have very time? Strange. I know. Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to do that before what? So school is for, you know, a half hour mm. before he, his shift starts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did that not appreciate bizarre. that at all. I did not. No. Mm. No, I did not appreciate that at all. I, I think that I was purely for kind of... Com- I mean, it, it is funny, that scene, I suppose, because he seems out of his depth and he seems kind of... And he's such an unlikely person for you to put in that role. Oh, anyway. so it was meant to be funny? I think, because it, I, think I was, was laughing it was... No, I, I, well, oh. I thought it was meant to be funny, okay. so it's just to put him in an awkward position. But it did remind me a little bit, because I've just you know, been working for the last few years on this book about the Channel Islands mm-hmm. in the war, and they were occupied by the Germans and the... Um, a lot of people I spoke to, because a lot of people I interviewed were kids at the time, and they said that because most of the school children evacuated and nearly all the professional teachers evacuated, the kids that were left, they did have this situation where they'd be taught, you know, the headmaster of one of these schools was actually a farmer, and he'd come in every morning still in his Wellington boots and his farming gear, give the assembly, go back out on the farm. And so they were very much like muddling by with anyone who was free and, you know, could remember a little bit about something, and that's all they had for five years. I mean, oh, they didn't wow. have much choice. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them said, well, yeah, it probably wasn't the best education, but, you know, we did the best we could, basically, and, you know, they sort of appreciated the effort that had been made for them. But, I mean, it did remind me a little bit of that. And really, like I say, you know, there's no reason why it should be like that on this big space yeah. station. Everyone's and coming and going the federation, whole time. Yeah, like yeah. an institute <laughs> in and of itself, they should surely be able to send a teacher you their think? way. Definitely. You know, I mean, and if she wants to, you know, fill in until a teacher does decide to come... Th- that would be fine, like you say. And and it does express the importance of education, that mm-hmm. these kids should be have, having an education. And like you said, those kids during the wartime, like any information, any education is better than none. And so kudos to that. And I guess the kind of teaching arc uh, for Keiko for Deep Space Nine, I sort of feel like it's worth it because you get that payoff in In the Hands of the Prophets, which is a really interesting episode, probably, well, almost certainly the most interesting Keiko O'Brien episode in Star Trek, I'd say. And there, you know, we really do see her. You, you, If you only watched that episode, you would kind of think she'd been a teacher all her life and she's yes. really passionate about it. She has a very strong view about, you know, the kind of sort of moral questions around teaching and around the importance of education and so on. Um, and I think maybe that episode in itself almost makes that storyline worth it but I mean that's it's a very interesting one and it's one where we see the kind of controversies and the kind of a danger aside from anything else involved in some of these kind of teaching issues and it reminds me as well also in Enterprise we kind of see the same thing with the episode North Star where there's a teacher who's tried and sent to prison effectively for 10 years for teaching you know illegal right. stuff that's not meant to be covered but Keiko definitely finds herself in the midst of this kind of real dispute that blows up because of her teaching something that, as far as she's concerned is completely uncontroversial you know it's just science it's right. what everyone that yeah. she knows and everyone she works with understands to be the reality of of the world and yet suddenly she gets hit by this kind of fundamental religious campaign against her basically mm-hmm. it, it's just surprising that that would still show up in the 24th century mm-hmm. you know uh definitely echoes to the time of you know do we teach creationism 
you know, versus Big Bang Theory. Uh, it, it's still a debate, mm. unfortunately, in, in many states. Uh, but I understand where she's coming at. I taught a class, a math class, and it, nothing is, you know, spiritual or moral, moralistic as that. But, mm. you know, they were asking me to teach this class and have it be a study skills instead of teach the curriculum that is designed for. And I said, no, I'm not going to put my name and sign my name saying that I'm teaching this course if it's just going to be a glorified study skills class. Right. You know, yeah. and so yeah. you, you, sometimes even now I have to stand up and say, no, I'm going to teach the curriculum and don't ask me to not do it because I will teach the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's interesting in Keiko's situation because she has, she's presumably developed that curriculum herself and it's like cutting edge. I mean, she's talking about the wormhole, which has only been discovered like yeah. less than a year ago, right? But she's, you know, she's absolutely teaching in the kind of Starfleet method, but I suppose, or a Federation method, but she hasn't realized that there's this, she, she's almost like tapped into this uh, undercurrent of, conflict that is is not quite spilling over that do, do you know what i mean because it seems like the bashurans and the federation people obviously they do have these kind of differences of interpretation these different opinions but they've kind of kept them to themselves it hasn't really come up and yet right. suddenly she's kind of tapped into this massive you know bomb literally yeah. <laughs> about to go off uh because of it and it's kind of i think it's interesting the extent to which you know she really stands her ground and she really stands up for you know doing the right thing and so on but it does raise other sort of interesting questions around you know, for example, Kira in that episode basically says she thinks they should have faith schools on Deep Space Nine and, you know, the Bajorans should have their own schools and really they shouldn't be sharing schools with the Federation kids, which is quite a surprising... It's a very un-Star Trek attitude, I suppose. I mean, I don't know what the situation's like in the States. Here in England, it's quite a sort of divisive issue, you know, the sort of rise of faith schools and people saying, well, we want our kids to be educated, in, you know, to get their religious education in school. Uh, as opposed to saying, well, you know, take them to church if you want them to get that and yeah. bring them to school for the kind of, you know, the sort of state secular side of things. So there's kind of, there's that element, I suppose. And then, of course, there's also the kind of historical analogy with, you know, with, yeah, as you say, the teaching of evolution. In America, it was, they call it the monkey trial. Is that right? There's this kind of big, it was this big Ferrari over this particular case of this teacher who'd been uh, teaching evolution and it, became, it kind of blew up into this massive thing. But mm -hmm. that was in the 1920s, I think, wasn't it? It was a long, uh, long time ago. I don't know about that. It's Brown versus the Board of Education. I think it's something called Scopes. Oh, was the one that I was reading about. But um, well, right, okay. What was Brown versus the Board of Education? I think it was. That, that. Is that the one? I yeah. Think, yeah. Okay, right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm mixing it up with something else. But anyway, I mean, it's this is you think in the distant past uh, from our point of view. But it's interesting you say you know these issues are still coming up today, and you know, and they are to some extent in England as well. Insofar as we have these issues about secular schools versus state schools uh, versus um, faith schools um, and so on. I mean, the, the school that I went to, it was quite unusual in this respect, I think, because it was quite a multicultural school. They would have every Thursday, so, so there was nothing religious in the, in the kind of general practice of the school, but every Thursday they'd have uh, different assemblies for each different faith group, in a sense. Oh. So there would be a Christian assembly, there'd be a Jewish assembly, there'd be a Muslim assembly, I think. Uh I don't know if there were any more. I didn't go to any of them. <laughs> I, I went, and then there was like a, a kind of, you know, atheist slash sort of secular sort of general assembly, which would be a teacher who just talked about any topic. Do you know what I mean? They might talk about their holiday or they might talk about, you know, I don't know, some sort of topical issue or something, which in some ways were quite interesting assemblies because you just got someone talking about something they were passionate about. But so I suppose that was one way of kind of working around this difficult area. But the other thing is, you know, we had, I don't know how this works in the States, but, you know, we, we would be forced to study religious education where you learn and they try very hard to make the curriculum. I mean, teachers don't always, in my experience, stick to it, but the, the idea is that it kind of treats all the religions equally. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Even though the teacher is most likely to be a Christian, probably. Bias, yeah. Uh, and so on, that they're supposed to give equal weight to Buddhism or to, you know, Hinduism or, or whatever it is. You know, so there's a kind of, um, at least the idea that you're treating all these things in a kind of secular fashion, even if you're studying the beliefs of those different religions. Right. I, 
It's interesting because uh, being born and raised in Utah, mm. where uh, Mormonism is very prevalent, uh, I think they came up with a good solution as well. Like <clears throat> we would have, you know, people would send their kids to public education uh, and then starting, uh, I think it is, uh, let's see. Ninth grade. So what is that? You're 13, 14, like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you go to what's called seminary. So in Utah, it was a period of the day because our seminaries were built next to our high schools. Okay. So we would, the, the church worked it out with the schools that it was okay that they could leave campus, go across the street to attend seminary and then come back to campus. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to, you know, during my seven period day, one of my periods, I'd go to seminary. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work in all states because there's not so many Mormons. So what they do is before school starts, um, they will go to what's called early morning seminary. Mm -hmm. So uh, my school, um, we start at 7 a.m. So the kids go from 6 to 6.45 in the morning. When do they get up? (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know, know, we're 6 to 6.30 and then make their way to school. So they do this so that they get their spiritual Mm -hmm. guidance, you know, to accompany they're secular. But it's in a different building and it's kind of, yeah, that's interesting. So that's a way of kind of yeah treating them as separate things. Right. But yeah. 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 And I am and I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, why don't they do that? Like Keiko is going to teach your school, your secular, and then just pull them aside and teach them your religion. Like mm. that seems, you're, the whole school doesn't have to, you know, abide. And it shows them like if, you know, like uh, Mormonisms believe in creation. And so God mm-hmm. created the world. Well, you have to know how to deal with people who don't have that same belief. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to, you know, completely sh- cut them off from all knowledge. I mean, because not everyone's going to believe, you know, in the prophets, mm-hmm. as in the case, you mm-hmm. know, so it's like, teach them. And then you get to tell them, well, this is how we believe the prophets and stuff mm. like that so there's that great bit of dialogue where i mean keiko it, it's, it's funny you know you know people often dislike keiko because they think she's too kind of you, you know strong-willed or c- complaining the whole time or whatever but there's that great moment where she really fedek win arrives and says to her you know why aren't you teaching about the prophets and she basically says well that's your job isn't it <laughs> yeah she absolutely stands exactly. up to her and like gives it back and i think that's kind of her perspective is that really it's 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 not within her mm. scope of, of what her job is as a teacher is to engage with those things at all. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not her business. Yeah. But Wynne doesn't really, you know, won't accept that. She doesn't like the idea of there being anything that she's not kind of in control of in that way. And I suppose on Bajor, presumably there, you know, there wouldn't be a school where these things weren't taught or whatever. It's kind of, that's considered to be part of the curriculum or part of the understanding um, of those things. But the other thing that, that episode brought up that I was thinking about is that it does tap into, you know, not just the fact that there's this controversy, not just this idea that, you, you know, that some of these kind of issues, particularly when you're dealing with, I don't know, uh, faith organizations or parents with strong opinions on things, because it, it might not be a religious thing. It might be something like sex education is quite a controversial yeah. area where, you know, some people will be lobbying and saying, don't teach children about sex. It'll make them go and have more sex, you, you know, and whereas the kind of more, uh, hopefully I think mainstream view is like to, you know, educate them about it so that they're safer, whatever they're doing. And you're not really going to be encouraging them to do things they wouldn't be doing otherwise. But the other thing that it kind of brought up for me is, you know, Keiko's school gets blown up. I mean, she, you know, and her class could very easily have been killed if they'd been there at the time. Um, and I suppose one thing that is maybe the case in schools in America much more than here, because we're always reading about in the news is, you know, shootings and so on. That actually right, yeah. schools become potentially a, a dangerous place to be. I mean, I don't know, do you, do you feel as a teacher that you're working in a, I guess you can't feel like you're working in a dangerous environment on a day-to-day basis, do you? But I mean, is that something you worry about? Is that something you're kind of aware of? Definitely with the number of shootings at schools mm. in the U.S., it it's terrifying. And this last one, you know, now should we arm our teachers? Mm. Like, should I be carrying my gun mm. to school with me? And... 
it's opened up this huge debate and, and it makes me wonder, I'm like, why are we coming at it from this perspective? Why aren't we trying to fix the problem where there's no guns at school? Mm -hmm. Like, there should not be any shootings at school. Arming me only brings more guns to school and I don't want there to be any, mm -hmm. not even the one. So it's been a very hot debate I'm in America and I think it's extended everywhere that it's like, what, what are we doing to protect our children? Mm. I don't feel uh, that way where I'm at now, but when I was teaching at-risk schools with the gang violence, the knives and potential guns, it was more in my mind, mm. you know, that it's like, yeah, I'm going to protect these kids. You know, if there's, a, you know, gangs coming onto campus because we've got, we teach, you know, multiple mm -hmm. gang members. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been on my mind more so than any adult violence coming. But I mean, it must be, I, I suppose the difference there is it's not necessarily violence coming from the outside. So I right. mean, we had in Britain, we had this school shooting, which completely changed the laws here. And it was a, I don't remember what the sort of background to it was, but it, anyway, it was an adult man who went in and killed a whole group of, of kids. And literally, I, I mean, I feel like it was like days later, very soon afterwards, they passed new laws and they basically made people hand in their guns, which I know, you know, is probably not going to happen in the United States. But I mean, but it was, it wasn't kids doing it. Whereas in the States, it seems like it's, what it is, it's, yeah. it's like, you know, angry teenagers who get hold of their parents' guns and, yeah. you know, and have all the kind of emotional traumas and issues. And, you know, I mean, school is a place where there's a lot of unhappy people, I suppose, and a lot of, you know, anger going around. To feel that that anger could be directed in such a violent way is yeah. scary. I mean, it would put me off, you know, if I had kids, make me worry about sending them to school in the States. I don't know. <laughs> Well, you're lucky you're over here then. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I did I did do a term of schooling in the States, actually, of primary school uh, when I was about, I think, maybe like seven or something. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Oh. Because the school there was just, it was, I mean, talking about these sort of different kinds of curriculums and so on, everything just felt so much more creative. There was more arts and music and everything. Playground was amazing. The playground, playground in this primary school had one of those like zip wire oh. things, all this kind of, you, you know. And also I was there in the autumn and I was there for Halloween and the whole class went out trick or treating together oh, yes, which in course. those days was something that didn't I don't know anyone trick or treated here and if they did it was like a really small I mean it is now a thing but in those days it wasn't at all so for me it was like totally magical experience yes, going to an American school our Halloween school, but, parade yeah. I yeah. remember that <laughs> <laughs> not that we've seen that on Star Trek so far as yeah. far as I know but one of the things that strikes me about schooling in Star Trek is the other side of it that we see maybe a little bit more is this idea of testing. And we see, you know, Wesley trying to apply to Starfleet Academy and the, frankly, sort of uh, astonishingly complicated tests he has to go through to do that. We see in terms of like the kind of Vulcan educational system, and we know obviously that Spock's mother teaches on Vulcan, but we see the only teaching I think we see is this kind of computerised teaching. And it's all, it all seems to be about asking questions, you know, whether they're in those little pods or at Spock in... Uh, Star Trek 4, you know, the how do you feel computer machine that's kind of rapidly firing questions at them. And I suppose that's maybe something that, you know, is a big part of education. And certainly over here, and I'm sure it's the same in the States, is a big kind of controversial area. Are we kept testing kids too much? Are we kind of hothousing them? I mean, the school I went to was quite academic. It was quite focused. We spent a lot of time looking at old exam papers and kind of, you know, not to say that we didn't have an enriching educational experience as well but there was definitely that kind of pressure to make sure everyone knew exactly what was coming up in the next exam and did the best they possibly could um, and in this country certainly we've been sort of moving towards testing kids more and more often and putting more and more pressure on the results of those tests and you know partly because there's you know universities want more information to make judgments on and, and all this sort of thing and you know so I'm kind of interested what's your take on that kind of the, the role of testing as we see it in Star Trek and how that relates to, you know, I guess you, you presumably set tests and mark tests and do, I mean, that's a big oh, yes. part of, of teaching. Is, it <laughs> is, and it is so much more the focus because, well, we had the Bush administration bring in No Child Left Behind and that mm -hmm. really focused in on testing and that here we are and we need to improve. And 
albeit it may not have been the best solution, it was, it got the nation talking about our education problems. But I don't think testing is the answer. And so, yeah, bring up that. And like we see it in uh, Discovery, you know, Mm -hmm. where Burnham's, yeah, in these pods. And she didn't answer it quick enough. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not only that you have to be right, but you have to be fast. Like, Mm -hmm. what are we testing? Are we testing her recall? You know, are we testing that she understands the nuances? I don't understand what those tests are testing for, in my opinion. But... There is so much testing, especially with this No Child Left Behind. So now the states and the schools have to do proficiency testing in order. Are you going, are you able to graduate high school? So somehow there was a disconnect of you earning grades meant that you were qualified to graduate. Mm -hmm. So we lost that. And now, well, we have a test that says you're ready to graduate. Well, if you can just take a test, then why do you need all of these, you know, courses? Mm -hmm. Like, it it seems to not line up very well. That's always the question that I have. And then I have to prepare my students for SAT and ACT tests. And that affects their entire future because where they go to college and, you Mm -hmm. know. And so we now come to label these tests. These are high stakes versus low stakes tests. And I'm like, can we just have a test be a test and Mm. not have it determine so much of a child's future? Mm. You know, and I think testing has gone overboard because of that, that if you don't do well, on your ACTs or SATs, then you're not getting into the college or university. You're not even eligible for scholarships because you don't have this mm. test score, you know. And so some people really need this money to go. Otherwise, they're not going. Yeah. You know, so too much is hanging on these tests. And I see it. I never was a very good test taker. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, I have kids and it's so frustrating as a teacher. They will miss And then come in, take the test, and, you know, get an A or a B. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you weren't even in the class, and you're still passing the test. Oh, I'm a good test taker. Well, yeah. Yeah, so... No, it's I think that's absolutely true. And I mean, I say, like, I was always very good at exams, but I don't think it's necessarily the fairest... Do you know what I mean? There's right. a certain set of skills, and partly that's about, like, being good at cramming stuff. I'm not saying it is all about cramming stuff the night before, but it is also about kind of memory and like... It is. And thinking on yeah. the spot and kind of certain kind of ability to do things. It doesn't necessarily actually reflect... No. The whole picture at right. all, you know. The context of the learning and do yeah. you, you know, bring it into your life? Is it meaningful? Yeah. Do you know how to incorporate the knowledge versus yeah. here are the facts? That, yeah. yeah. And you've forgotten them the next week. Yeah. You know, you you know testing, yeah. you know, only really gives an assessment on one portion Mm. of education Mm. you know and in university when I was going through we you know of course spent so much time on assessment like what do you what are you assessing and uh, one year I gave verbal Mm. assessments where I would have a conversation Mm -hmm. I couldn't continue this because to do this for 200 kids is Mm. not right yeah logistically (laughs) feasible but I wanted to give it a try and so I would have a conversation about the unit that we were talking about happened to be quadratics Mm -hmm. and the kids were able to describe it or not and Mm. I could tell if they had learned it you know I just I wish there was more than logistically more than just paper and pencil Mm. that I could really assess if my students have learned it well it's interesting that in Star Trek of course it's the Vulcans that we see who seem to be obsessed with testing as their their main mode of teaching uh, rather than get the sense that we see much of that in the kind of Federation yeah. classrooms. I mean, outside of Starfleet. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, Starfleet yeah. Academy. Starfleet Academy, definitely big on the testing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but they seem pretty kind of hardcore yeah. Starfleet Academy. <laughs> Not sure any of us would be making it in Starfleet Academy if we were applying. But you know. Well, um, I did want to point out that mm-hmm. in every case that we see any type of education going on, the student-to-teacher ratio... Mm-hmm extremely low that's true that is true yeah and even in the testing you know in their testing it's these one little pods uh in the 
one with Wesley, they're sort of in this room, mm -hmm. and there's six, five of them. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Very small class sizes. So definitely. Keiko is the one that we see the largest, and I think I remember there were 12 yeah. students, yeah. which is a far cry from my 35 sure. to 40 in a class. Of course, this may have something to do with, you know, the cost of hiring children as extras and yeah. you know, how many of them you can and keep on set at one time. And building a set that's yeah. large enough yeah, yeah, to definitely. how it's sporty. Yes, I but understand, no, but right. <laughs> that, you know, the, that perception yeah. Yeah. is not realistic. No, they have an easy time of it in that sense. You know, and I suppose that makes sense because they're slightly random locations for a school, you know, a starship or whatever. I don't know how many... I don't know if they ever tell us how many kids there are on the Enterprise D. But it's interesting in, in When the Bow Breaks, for example, they do, they may mention how many kids there are there, but those aliens are only interested in, again, like half a dozen of them, you, you know, that are actually going to feature in the episode. And the rest, we're kind of just, we have to sort of understand that they're all around somewhere, but we don't ever really, you're right, we don't ever see like a whole school assembly or any kind of gathering yeah. of, of the children in, in large numbers, which might be quite interesting in some ways to get a sense of, the largest you know, gathering, like? I think we would... institution is like? Yeah, I think the largest gathering we see is uh, Captain Picard Day. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hadn't thought of that. That's, yeah. Yeah, because there we see quite a few of the children gathered with their... Yeah. Captain their projects, Picard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been fun talking about teaching uh, and Star Trek this week with Amy, and it's been great to have you over here. Before we go, do you want to let the listeners know where they can find you on the Trek FM network, which I'm sure they know already, uh, and also if they want to get in touch with you on social media, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, you can find me. Uh, I host The Edge, which is our Star Trek Discovery podcast. I do that with Patrick Devlin. You can find me on Earl Grey with Justin and Richard, where we, of course, talk Next Generation. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson, and I am currently doing my DS9 rewatch, so getting a bunch in there. And you can find me on the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. And thank you so much, Duncan, for having me on. I really appreciate it. So glad to be over here in the UK. It's been a pleasure, and it's great to have you here as well. Well, talking about teaching in Star Trek is not the only thing we've been doing this week, so here's a listen to some of the other things you might have missed on the Trek FM network. Previously on Trek.fm, Literary Treks. I wouldn't say it's totally different, but I would say there's some difference to it. Uh, yeah, I did see some elements that reminded me of the Trouble with Troubles, and yeah, you know, certainly I'm not in a piece of the action, I can see that too. It does have that comedy element, just like those episodes do. But I think this is, this takes it a little further, and is a little more slapstick. Uh, yeah, than very slapstick. So, um, <laughs> but again, there's certain tones and certain elements that do remind me of those other, those other episodes, so. Warp 5. I do want to mention also that uh, just something that this, this came up when I was working on Nights of the Living Dead. George Romero hated the word zombie and didn't think of his creatures as zombies. But, um, yes. and, and it's one of the reasons why there's only some overlap between what we saw in Night of the Living Dead and everything you just described from, from West African and, and Caribbean folklore. Because of that, the, the, the two, basically, you kind of got, you know, undead peanut butter and zombie chocolate, and you wound up with what everybody now thinks of as zombies. Meta Trex. Just imagine the worst case scenario that could happen and, and look at all the bad things that have happened in history. And then you realize, hey, even if the if the worst possible scenario unfolds, that's not too bad in the grand scheme of things right here in the present. I was going to say some people read Marcus Aurelius. Riker goes to the holodeck. The 602 Club. I, I definitely agree. I thought that the writer did a great job of portraying Han. And Han's a hard character to nail down because... Mm -hmm. I think he I think it was really hit and miss in the old legend stuff with Han there were some books that really glorified him as a character and tried to turn him into something that he wasn't and that's what else is happening on Trek.fm check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts if you're an Apple user be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. 
If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place is to join the larger conversation at the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type in Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. We are Primitive Culture and we are your hosts. My name is Clara Cook and you can find me on Twitter at Clara Jean MC. My co-host is Duncan Barrett and you can find Duncan on Twitter at Barrett's Books. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Now I'd like to express a big thank you to our executive producer, Amy Nelson. You can find Amy Nelson on the Earl Grey podcast on Trek FM. So thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast about our history, our culture, and how Star Trek relates to it. You're blended already.